do the very first thing. I wanted to put a profound graphic in front of you. It's one of the most profound ones I've ever done. <laughs> it's a plank, all right? It's a laminated plank. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, a um, without the little fulcrum in the middle, it is a continuum. But basically it is this. It is my life drawing. From, from what, from everything I have learned, that is my life growing. And it's always with the idea of how do I stay balanced between the various pressures, the various situations, and I'm always seeking that balanced place, okay? I have dyslexia, however you pronounce that thing. I can't spell it either, so you just know right off the, off the bat. And you say, okay, how does that play into this continuum we've got here? Well, if you come out on one end of the continuum, you, you're, you've got this disability on this side. How do you stay balanced? There you go, brother. He's my go-to guy. I mean, he's got the answers. It's time. Because every challenge has its advantage. What happens when you have dyslexia is you can't write. Or if you write, it's pretty much unintelligible. Okay? So, how is it that I write so much? Technology. <laughs> well, it is. The spell checker is my life. But ultimately, what happened was for every disability, you have an ability that comes to the front. Uh, they tell us that people who have lost their vision have an increased sense of smell and hearing and you know other sensations of touch because there's an offsetting advantage. I don't write notes to myself. Have you noticed I don't preach from notes or teach from notes? The only way I do any writing is when I'm at home on a computer. If you asked me to write my name, you probably wouldn't be able to read it. Okay? So what's the offsetting advantage? I had to learn to concentrate very hard and store everything here. When I was in college, one of the classes we were supposed to take was logic. All right? And logic is a very difficult class. Only about six of us had the courage to take it. And the professor was a nice young man, and then he was uh, doing a wonderful job, and he kept saying to me, Bob, he said, you got to take notes in my class. There's no way you can remember all this stuff when it comes to the final time. you got to write stuff down. And I tried. Pretty soon I had to quit. I couldn't. But if I could listen, and I could put his thoughts together, like when I'm writing a sermon, it's, it's a tree. There's a, a main stem, a trunk, in every sermon. And then the main points are the branches that come off of that. So there's a graphic going on in my head. And I remember conversations. So it ended up that I have a tremendous memory for how a conversation or a lecture or somebody else's sermon went. All right? And it's a very structured format. So when somebody says, well, you didn't take any notes in that meeting, well, I know. But I can tell you exactly what the main points were, and what the illustrations were, and what the argument was. It, it's recorded. So dyslexia caused me to have this ability to remember and hold on to things inside. Now, when I get Alzheimer's, as my family is prone to do, that's probably going to go away. <laughs> but for now, hey, hey, hallelujah, 
I still got some things going. But I wanted you to know, if you find yourself with anything that you say is a negative, I just smile and say, cool, now let's find the positive. And you come back and say, I got nothing but positives. Let's dig a little deeper. Okay? Because you have to have something offsetting. And this continuum works beautifully. All right? You can use it for theological concepts. All right, let's just play a game. All right? Put God's love over here. Permanent or temporary? What is it? Good and solid? Unchangeable? Nothing's going to get to you? No, no one is going to be able to take you out of my hand? All oh, that isn't that wonderful? Our friends in the Baptist, uh, whom I love very dearly, I was on the board in the Baptist church for eight years, uh, trustee and deacon and all kinds of things. They stand here looking toward the God's love end. God's never going to let us down. God's never going to abandon us. God's never going to stop. And what do we call that doctrine? Calvinism. Yeah, it's not. Sure, it's security. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so they've got this thing worked out so that this is the continuum. They've got this thing, they're focused over here. What's behind them that they don't see? Chaos. <laughs> I'll say I, I'm glad you said that. Over here on this side, you can't see the, the balance beam, but that's okay. Let's put our sinful nature, mm -hmm. our depraved, sinful, despicable nature. Okay? So if I'm sitting here looking at God's love, I don't have to worry too much because I'm completely protected. But if I'm looking this way and I see nothing but my failure, my sinfulness, my urges, my thoughts, my ideas, I become a little bit like Paul. I become a little bit like Martin Luther. I become a little bit like some of the great leaders of the church, Augustine, for instance, well, I am so obsessed and I'm looking at my failures to the point where I'm not sure I'm loved at all. Now what do we call that? Doctrinally? Ar Arminianism? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can fall away at the slightest heartbeat. As soon as you mm -hmm. fail, then you're done. Okay. Which one is scriptural? Both. Yes! Yes! Aples. <laughs> Brian, you have been replaced. <laughs> I'll take why? Why, <laughs> does, why does one group say these are the most important scriptures and I'm going to stay focused on them and other churches, just as legitimate, look at other verses and say these are the most important ones. That's how they interpret it. It's how they select. Mm -hmm. It's how they select. And to be honest with you, both are correct and both are wrong if you let it go clear out here to the outside ends. They both are wrong. You know why the those who believe in eternal security don't really believe in eternal security? They don't. Because they have to define reality. Reality is they have friends, they have loved ones, they have neighbors, they have buddies that have fallen away. It's just reality. So how do they define it? How can they make a place for that? If our human nature has caused some of our very special friends to fall away, how do we how do we describe it? How do we understand it? They weren't really saved in the first place. Yeah. Now, ask yourself the next question. You know what the next question is. Are you saved anyway? Who of us is uh, eternally secure? They looked like they were doing pretty good. I mean, they, they were really cooking. They were living it right. What happened? 
Is there any way you can prove that you will not have the same problem? So you see, <laughs> I'm sorry, it makes me so filled with joy. The correct position is recognizing both ends, but staying close to the focal point, the fulcrum, staying balanced. How can I be taking care of a Wesleyan church when I spent eight years taking care of a Baptist church? It's a good question. <laughs> All right. I just spent 15 months taking care of Nazarene Church. And you know what? They loved it. <laughs> they made me an honorary Nazarene. Why? Because what's in the middle? Just balance and logic and it's Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ yeah. It's Jesus Christ. He had a Judas problem. What is a Judas problem? What's the, the Judas syndrome? The trail. The sinful nature. Right there in the middle of his inner 12. He had the Judas problem. You tell me he didn't know? Of course he knew. Of course, he continued to love him. And what did he say to Peter on the last night of his life? I'll never betray you. Grab his sword and swing it around. Boy. I'm a fisherman, but I can do this pretty well. <laughs> Just give me a chance. I'll snap somebody's ear off. You know, that kind of thing. And what did Jesus say? Peter, Peter, Peter. Satan is going to sift you like wheat. Now, does that focus on God's love? Or on our weakness and imperfection? It was both. Because when he said it, he said, and when you have returned, returned meaning from that far away place that you never thought you would go, <laughs> encourage the brothers. Because they're going to have, they're going to need Right. So now you've got this whole idea, and we've played a little game with theology, and you know we 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 haven't proved anything. The point is, on every scale, on every issue, you have to find the balance point. You have to find the place where you can keep your perspective on both ends. Now, yesterday was election day. Who won? In Kansas. It hasn't been decided yet. Johnson County still hasn't got their votes turned in yet. <laughs> <laughs> the most populated county in the, in the state, and we're slow getting our balance count. Some of them are missing somewhere. <laughs> okay, let's just talk, let's have fun. Nobody's uptight here. The election's already over. We, the, the ballots are cast. So we know that. <laughs> What's the dividing faction of our nation politically? What's our dividing portion? What was it? Democrats and Republicans. No. Really? Well, Surprisingly, yeah. no. Those are names that we use. We use things like liberal and conservative. They're totally irrelevant. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. That wasn't. And putting you were all like, it was just that's the answer I was looking for. That was really the answer I was looking for, but it isn't accurate. I have lived all over this country. I have lived in Boston, Massachusetts. I have lived in Miami, Dade County, Florida. I have lived in San Diego. I have lived in Saginaw. And all, what is the great dividing issue of our day? In our society today, politics. In, in the political well, realm. Yeah. In the political realm. Uh, I don't want to get told no, so I'm not sure what to say. Okay, well, let, me, let me take it away, because it really isn't. 
On this end, we have rural America. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. In this end, we have urban America. When you have lived in all the places I have lived, you will understand how can somebody as crazy as a person who would live in right in the heart of Dade County, Miami, Florida, how can you live in the least densely populated county in almost the United States? I lived for 15 months in Grant County, Oregon, served in Grant County, Oregon, where the only stoplight in the entire huge, massive county was in our downtown Center Street crossing and you could drive for hours in any direction and never see another car. It was three hours to the Kmart. It was three hours to the hospital. It was three hours to the Walmart. It was three hours to the movie theater. You talk about rural. They got rural down the path. Okay? Make a day trip to go to the breakfast. It does. And you load up once in a while, and you fill the hole back into the car, and you bring enough home that you can live on for a while. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Okay. What does the rural lifestyle look like? The rural lifestyle is self-sufficient. We got it covered. We're working together. We got brothers and sisters and cousins and everybody living around here nearby. Nobody's moved in a hundred years. Everybody's <laughs> related to somebody else. If you got a problem, we all know about it because we all know you, and we're okay with you, and we're going to take care of you. And if the flood happens to happen, or the, the raging wildfires nearly burned the town down two years in a row, okay? And they all pitch together. They all get the bulldozers out there. They all plow into the mountainsides to try and put fire breaks in to try and save everybody's home all together because we're all in it together. There's nobody to depend on. They never go to the government for anything. In fact, they just assume the government has their hands on it. They're angry about the government. We can handle it ourselves. Now, what does somebody in Dade County, Miami, feel? The problems are so big, we cannot do anything about them. If the government doesn't fix it, we're going to have to have some you know, protest in the streets because we need better this, we need better that, we've got to have somebody come in here and take care of this and that. The political divide is not B and R, as often as we refer to that, or liberal or conservative. It is your perspective of being urban or rural. And in every state, the state of Oregon has this huge section from the center all the way to the eastern border with Idaho. It's rural, totally. But you got Portland. <laughs> what happens between the two? They don't see eye to eye. They don't understand what the other one's thinking. They don't have any concept of why they would feel so passionately about things. So when you look at my balance beam, you can put anything on there you wish. But here's the key, and this is the lesson for tonight, so I haven't drifted far afield. If you are not willing to stop focusing on just your own individual mindset, whichever direction that happens to be, and you begin to say somebody else has a completely legitimate perspective on what they are trying to accomplish and what they think is important, I probably shouldn't listen to them. I shouldn't pay attention. I should not call them just a bunch of crazy idiots. I, 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 I know, come on. <laughs> You've taken all the fun out of our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy idiots means I don't have to pay any attention to you and I can just write you off. Okay? Now, we've gone through how many lessons we've talked about God's command, Jesus' command to love, 
as I have loved you? Who did Jesus call crazy idiots? He didn't even call Judas a crazy idiot. And he had a perfect right to it. Okay? Um, no, he didn't. He looked at each person with something, some kind of respect, appreciation, or some kind of something that, that he tried to help or correct or try and straighten out what needed to be done over there. He paid very close attention to who he was dealing with. Okay, so we've already had that command. We've already looked at the two kinds of love, both conditional and unconditional, and how God has both kinds of love. We've already talked about the parent, the adult, and the child. Uh, in every book, you will find um, slips in the front cover, just inside the front page, where if you need to look at the discussion that we've had, the Vimeo recording that discuss, discusses each one of those is in that little slip that's right there on the, the front rings, right on the front of the book, okay? I certainly haven't done justice to any of them up to this point tonight, but that is some of what has led us to this point. Now today, we start making a practical, social contract with each other on how we're going to put into practice the very lessons we have been studying. How do we do unconditional love? How can we do conditional love? How can we do Jesus Christ kind of love? How can we do the command correctly to love as he did? How do we live with the parent, the adult, and the child? You don't want to listen to that video anyway, because that one's kind of important to understand what we're dealing with here. Well, we finally come together where we actually start to put together ten rules. Now, I completely misquoted Paul when he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course. So I made these the ten rules to a good fight. <laughs> It isn't what he meant, but it, it works for me, okay? Because it incorporates all the things we have talked about up to this point, and it will continue beyond. Do you remember, for instance, what is the deepest fear of women? The deepest fear of those with the XX chromosomes. Not your letter. To be abandoned? You're right. You're right. Absolutely right. You're still my go-to guy. All right. Yes. To be abandoned, left behind, locked out, isolated, turned away, maybe used, probably abused, insecure, scared to death, scared to death. Every single day. Every day. And what's the man in the relationship supposed to do with that reality? Oh, God has come. Or is it left me? Yeah. Push that fear into the dark corners and out of the main part of the attention. Do whatever it takes to push that fear into the background. Why does the husband say, I love you six times more often than the wife? The wife needs to hear it. God, I have it. I'm hungry to hear it. And if she's saying, I love you first, boys, you're in trouble. <laughs> Because if she says it first, she's hungry to hear it. You haven't said it often enough. And she's working it around so that if you don't say, uh-huh, me too, ditto, or something, it's a butcher knife during the night. Bury yourself. <laughs> okay? Because that fear is going to be there until the last day they draw their breath and go, okay, that's done. Okay, that's good. I was loved. All right? What's the deepest fear of the man? Heights. <laughs> <laughs> a 
second that. Thank you, Jacob. The fear of getting fired. The fear of wrecking your car or motorcycle. But no, come on, what what are we talking about? What's the deepest fear? Not being appreciated. Not being appreciated. 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 What are some other connotations? Honored, respected, looked up to, admired. Okay? Why does every woman in the entire world think their boyfriend, husband, or whatever else is nothing but an egomaniac? Total, I mean, you listen to any group of ladies, get together. You unbelievable! He's always worried about what somebody's going to think about him. Why? He's nothing but all. He's just he's nothing but ego. Come on, have you signed up for it? That's who he is. He's got that XY thing going, and he is never ever going to feel like he can legitimately have someone look up to him and respect. Always feels a little bit like a phony. What am I going to get discovered for who I really am? Yeah. Because I'm afraid of being exposed as someone who was never really worthy of being respected. Now, how does the female person that in this relationship? deal with that particular fear. Oh, honey, you're so great. There you go! <laughs> <laughs> you lost your spot in, buddy. You slapped it, buddy. It's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> a little off your game there, huh? You're gonna, you're gonna bruise his ego. <laughs> Honestly. How? You're doing good, Brian. Yo, yeah. How, how can it possibly be that she can be married to a person she thinks is an idiot and still look up to her. <laughs> who has made so many mistakes, who can't find his keys. If she wasn't there to find stuff, he would be lost forever. How can you look up to somebody who has absolutely fouled up one time right after the other on a continuous list, and I have it all written down? No wonder they say you'd lose your head if I wasn't here to keep it on you. That's it. That is the problem. That is the issue. We are in an impossible situation. When God created this mess, he smiled and said, they're not going to be able to do this without my help. Because <laughs> it is the hardest thing you will ever do if you decide to do it. Uh, it goes through every kind of relationship. So it's not like you can say, well, that's only for at home when I have this problem. No, it's in the office. No, it's at church. No, it's your mother-in-law. No, it's your Uncle George. You look at every person. You, I was in a uh, family get-together. That was a nice little get together, beautiful. The wintertime fireplace was going. I sat on the hearth, the fire was behind me. It was wonderful. Hanging out with nice people. And the guy's father came up, mid 70s, something like that. And he sat down to me. He was sitting there in the front of the fire. And he said, Boy, I'll tell you what. My third grade teacher would sure feel like an idiot. She said, I'd never amount to anything. And look where we are today. What was he saying? What was he saying? What was his deepest fear? His third grade teacher hit him right on the most sensitive spot and it stuck. For 60 years, he's been trying to prove that lady wrong. But he never forgot. Never put it down. And if he lives another 10 or 15 years, he'll fight it all the way to the end. Why? Because that's the way we're put together. And we have a 
responsibility. The second lesson is how do I, how do I listen to, be responsive to, and respond to this person who has an entirely different picture of what life is and how complicated it can be. Uh, I, I was at a reunion for my college class. We were sitting around the table, and the lady was in the class of 71 with me, and we started to talk about what it was like to go through college, 66 to 71. And I explained a number of things that had happened to me and what my college experience was like. And after the about 45 minutes of talking back and forth, she said, you didn't go to the same school that I went to, did you? I said, well, we were physically in the same location, but we shared nothing of what that life was like. Absolutely nothing. When I went to college in 1966 in September, it was still a segregated campus. You may not remember that. It was in all the newspapers at the time that you have to go back in the archives to find it. Yeah. And the students of color were usually in the athletic program. And they had to send pictures in in order to be placed in housing. I refused to send my picture in. I've been stubborn most of my life. And so on the only floor of the only dormitory, the top floor from the farthest dormitory away from the center of campus, every single person of color was placed in that floor of that dormitory. From any country, nationality, language, whatever else, they were all put on third floor of Morning Hall. 30 rooms, room 315 was my room. <laughs> all of my buddies, all the guys I hung out with, all of the people I spent the time with, even the girls that I went out on dates with, were all of color. And in 1966, that wasn't a popular place to be. When my college roommate in my junior year sent me off to go into the Navy, I was enlisting in the Navy, you know, midway through my junior year, he gave me a coffee mug. All right? We were the first men, the first people of two different races that were ever allowed to be roommates together. Okay? And he gave me a coffee cup that was absolutely chocolate brown all the way up until there was this white little roll of fit. It looked like fizz coming out of the top of it. <laughs> and he said, you're all the way black except just a little white. <laughs> That's amazing. You still have it? I put the handle back on three or four times and I decided not to use it anymore. It's on my shelf. <laughs> Johnny C. Hill. Uh, still very good friends. He went to Methesco Seminary and met a pastor almost this time. It, it, this, this was a wonderful relationship. Follow this if you can. How can you possibly understand what I went through when you were living in this little white red girl's dorm where there wasn't a black girl anywhere in sight you never touched one? You never interchanged with a one. I want you to understand. We're going to talk about how do we have a social contract. But it comes out of the very lessons we have already studied and put in. These are ways of putting them in practice. Let me pull one out here. We're going to start down through it. Flip on to the top here. It's the 10 rules for a good fight. And for those of you who don't have a perfect memory, 
I put this blank sheet in so you can make notes to yourself if you are so desired. But sometimes we don't bring no paper, so I just put in clean with it and you can use. All right? How do I put into place rules that will allow us to put loving responses into our normal torn up type relationships? Okay? Here's the way it starts. Every time we have a disagreement, every single time somebody gets a little miffed, a little hacked off, a little uptight, we start with these words. I love you. I will always love you. You are my, whatever the situation is, boyfriend, girlfriend, you are my cousin, you are my next door neighbor, you are my boss, you are my employee. I pledge myself to help you, to support you, and care for you, and I'm not going to stop taking care of you. Well, that just ruined the argument. <laughs> How can you start an argument that way? <laughs> Hopefully. You know why? What's the difference with the two kinds of love? Conditional, which means if you don't do what I want, I'm going to withhold my support and my compassion for you. What's unconditional? I'm going to love you no matter what. Rule one is don't ever forget in the midst of a conditional fight and you have a lot of conditional fights. <laughs> I'm not happy. I'm, what was that? Well, you, you start with saying this. And every time the voices go up a notch in pitch or volume, you say it again. And it'll pull them back down. All right? Never forget. <laughs> Joe Beth has gotten it down. <laughs> All right. Why? We have to understand conditional love teaches the other person something that they didn't know before. They, we're teaching them about us. We're teaching them about what we need or how we feel or what's important to us. That's conditional. But you don't ever let somebody feel like or understand that that's the only kind of love you have. It has to be a balance between the two. And when you're in a conditional fight, and, you know, I, we've had so many, 48 years now, I mean, we've been together. We've fought over so many things, you can't even believe it. Judy worked as a, for a CPA as an administrative assistant. During tax season, things get pretty crazy, and she works 80 hours a week, and it's, it's stupid. And so at one point, I didn't have a job, and I was working around the house or doing projects at the house. And she said, you have to do the dishes for me. I, I can fix the meals, but I'm not going to do the dishes anymore. It's too much to try and clean up after each meal. OK, that's a problem. We got a conditional situation. Because I'm not going to do dishes. <laughs> okay? I learned very early in my childhood dishes are gross. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Still need to be done. Knock me up. I will. Back to the nasty. I. I can put my hands in a vat of axle grease and work that into a wheel bearing, and I can pack that thing in hour and hour after hour, packing bearings and getting things to where they're actually up, and never flinch for a second. But if I take a dish that's been sitting stacked up with another one with spaghetti sauce that's now on the bottom, I retch. Yeah. <laughs> it smells just a little. That's the worst. Uh, it's so tactile. Oh. It's tactile. When I touch old food, 
cold food, slippery, nasty food. My stomach goes over. So what are we going to do? We have. <laughs> Okay, you're absolutely insistent, you're totally committed to this, I understand perfectly what you're feeling, I'm sympathetic to your needs, but if you want me to do this, it has to be done my way. Because I have needs too. All right? Never, ever, ever stack the dishes up. The bottoms must always be clean. That way, I can find this little clean spot around the edge. I'll get a hold of it over there. <laughs> and the bottoms are clean. I can get it under the faucet, and I'll brush off the, the goop in the top in the book. And by the time I get it rinsed off, I can touch the rest of it, and I can put it in the dishwasher. So, would it you stick it better if you stick it on top of it? No, no. Well, I can handle oil. I can, you can deep fat fry French fries, and I have no problem with it all. But if you touch a little bit of ketchup on the bottom of that plate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my brain goes crazy. Huh? Especially if you can't see it. You don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's you have to understand, I have the most amazing reputation. When I was in church camp, and I went every year, I was the only one who got away without having to do splasher duty at the end of each meal to wash the dishes for that particular table. I'd always grab the broom and I'd go and sweep in the floor. That took me out of the dishwashing thing. I have a nationwide reputation. <laughs> I don't do dishes. But you know what? I do dishes. You know why? Because rule number one says, even though it makes me sick, if you don't let me do it my way, I still love you. Never, ever, ever forget number rule number one. Now you say, but I don't want to remember rule number one. I lose too many arguments if I say <laughs> that first. How can anybody get what they need if they keep saying, I love you, I love you, I'm always going to love you, I'm always going to take care of you, I'm never going to do anything. Yeah, show me, go ahead and do what I want you to do. No. It, look. Judy and I are diametrically opposed to opposites. I talk continuously. <laughs> Judy listens continuously. I thought it was a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Until one day I said, why don't you ever tell me how you feel? I said you don't listen. And then one day she said, don't you ever shut up? <laughs> <laughs> and then the thing really started to get real. We have had some very, very intense arguments that lasted a very, very long time. Because we are diametrically opposed personality-wise. She was grown up in a, in a household that didn't argue, they didn't fight, they didn't have any disagreements, and if they did, they kept it themselves, and they were some of my best friends. Her, her brother was my age. Uh, we were, uh, grew up in the same town, and we were at each other's houses all the time, and in my family, we were crazy. We were just all over the place, bouncing and yelling and screaming and carrying on. TV was always going the way it was blasting. We had stuff going on all the time. All right. In the first year that I dated Judy in the, through the summer, I taught the entire summer all of the dates that we had. She only said three sentences. She didn't like Corvettes. Oh, oh, that broke my heart. She did like VWs. The Beatles were the kind that they had, not these sedans they had now. 
and her dad was having difficulty in the bank where he worked. Three sentences in a summertime. She was my ideal lady. <laughs> she listened to everything I had to say. But understand, we had to come to terms with the differences between us. And because she was just listening didn't mean that she accepted everything I said. And just because I talked all the time didn't even mean that I was meaning all the stuff that I was saying. And she, if she listened to it and took it seriously, some of the stuff was just off the wall. I mean, it was crazy stuff. Yeah, in that way. Or I used to be. Don't hold me to it now. <laughs> but we had to find a middle ground. And it happens when it comes to taking care of children, it comes to finances, it comes to every single issue that we live with in life. She is a penny pincher. She gets a dollar and a quarter value out of every dollar. It should be illegal what she does. Okay? I don't care what the cost is. If I need that bolt to whatever fixing one, I'll just go to the store and pay whatever the price is. I won't even negotiate or... <coughs> yell at somebody because they charge me sales tax or anything. I'll just, whatever it takes, I'll just do it. So when we do something, I will say, I need a bolt. She'll say, I'll find it. And she'll find it for the best price. And then I, you see how it worked? If we didn't come to terms with how we were going to be so different, it comes because we learned how to have conditional arguments and still stay unconditional. All right. Rule number one is probably the most important one of all of them in here, but I'm going to go ahead and keep moving on if I can quickly. I love you just the way you are. Some things can't be changed. Some things you couldn't change. And I won't ask you to change these. Physical uniquenesses, personality, values, or goals are most difficult to change. We won't argue about these things. Have you ever thought about just putting some things off out of bounds? I wish you had more hair. <laughs> Whoa. No, oh, I'm silly. I'm silly. I wish your hair was black instead of blonde. Whoa. <laughs> I wish that you could spell correctly. All right? It would be my, make my wife's life a lot easier if I could spell. What, can I take a course or something? <laughs> she is a micromanager. She's a list maker. She is fastidious, which means perfectionist, if you want to know yeah. how that works. And she's married to someone who is far by far not. <laughs> And so she will say to me, just this afternoon, you're going to get upset with me, but for the 14th time today, I'm going to tell you, you need to call this person. <laughs> yes, dear. No. I was Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you always do what you want. I mean, there's no argument. You may have a little latitude on the actual timing. <laughs> but she was right. I needed to call. I mean, it, was, it has to do with the orientation we'll do on Monday. Mm -hmm. When we can set up and what we can bring and, you know, what's the dress code and all that kind of thing. And all of this was all worked out. Everything's fine. But you need to call this person. Yeah, okay. You only have 30 minutes before we leave the airport. You need to call this person. <laughs> How do you love someone who nudges you that way? And very okay. <laughs> okay. Now listen, I'm, I'm, I love you the way you are. I don't want her to be different. If I didn't see what she does to bring balance in my life, to keep me in the center of this balance, I'd just be angry at her all the time, and she'd be mad at me. I am 
guaranteed the most irritating person Judy Anglin could have ever thought about spending her life with. <laughs> guaranteed. She didn't really need all that aggravation, did she? But I made her mad. She needed that. <laughs> so together we're a pair. We have been for a while. I do some very naughty, naughty things when I deal with people. And the first thing I do when two people come and sit down, we're not getting along very well. We're having problems. We're, you know, uh, this person is driving me crazy, and I can't stand to be close to this individual over here. But you know, okay, I always stop. Oh, okay, all right. I don't need to hear anymore. I got the picture. It didn't take long. All right? There's a war going on. I got that. I call it a tug of war, but then it's just, it is that. Now, you didn't start off this way. Let's just think for a second. Remind me, what was the one thing that you thought was the most attractive about that that you decided to start dating. What was the most attractive feature that you liked the best? I can't even remember. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, no, give me that. Well, uh, spend a lot of money buying me nice things and giving me gifts. Yeah, okay. How did it make you feel? Oh, I, I love it. You know, it's great. Oh, Fantastic. It made me feel like I was just loved completely. I, I couldn't stand it, 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 being away from him. I just, okay, cool. Now, why did you want to hang out with her? Oh, man. She laughed at my jokes, and she did this, and she wanted to go places with me, and she, she made me feel like I was 10 feet tall. So what changed? Is she still the same person? Yeah. Is he still the same person? Yeah. Then why aren't you doing it? Well, the very thing that I like the most about him is the thing that drives me crazy. Because now, if he gets a $10 bill in his pocket, he spends it. <laughs> It may be on me, but we can never have anything in the bank. He spends every dime. And what about you? What about them? Well, I still like going places. I still like doing things. I still like being with him. But he drives me crazy because Do you follow? They all tell the exact same story. They have forgotten what the other one brought to the mixture that they needed to have. They knew they needed it. They knew in this inward voice, I have to have what this person brings into my life. And congratulations, that's going to be the thing that drives you the most out of your gourd. Completely crazy. All right? It's just the way it works. Because we see the value of it at the beginning. We think it's never going to cause us problems. We can't imagine how that could ever be something other than just wonderful. Until we actually have to live with it seven days a week. And then all of a sudden, all the irritations start. So, what we have to do is go back to the beginning and say, do I love you the way you are? And I'm not going to ask you to change? Well, wait a minute. How does someone who spends all the cash 
how can you love someone just the way they are when they spend all the money that they make? Go on, help me. Come on, you're not really trying. I Put mean, her in I charge of the money. Give him an allowance. If he spends his whole allowance, fine. Who cares? <laughs> okay. It, 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 there is a solution. There is always a solution. There is never a problem that we cannot find a solution to. And then he's going to go, I'm not going to live that way. Oh, yeah, you will. Because you need to. You're uncontrollable. If she doesn't throttle back your spending habits, you're going to go out of business. Get with it. Okay? And so what we do is we find and rediscover the value of what the other brings to bring balance. And then we don't challenge the thing that we need the most. Instead, we treasure it. I like you just the way you are. I'm not going to try and change you. I want you to be exactly the person that you are. Okay? I've only gotten through two of the rules. <laughs> That's pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> Continuation next week. And we're going to do the other eight the next time we get together. But I wanted you to understand this is a way. Now, what we do is we take these pages that you've got here, and I offer you free copying service. I'll make you as many hundreds of these as you need to stick them all over your, your house, your life, your room, whatever it is, to help remind you. Because once we have gone through all ten, here's the way it works. All of a sudden, we'll be in a discussion. We'll start down the path, and someone goes, time out. You broke number one. Go back to the beginning. Let's start again. Penalty, five-yard penalty. You broke number two. You told me you were going to praise me just the way I am, and all of a sudden, you're saying the one thing that I am, you want to be changed. Five-yard penalty for breaking rule number two. <laughs> Okay? Because you can't remember them. You can't obey them. Why? Because if you remember the last lesson, we have a parent and we have a child. The parent wants to stay in control and the child wants to run away and play. If we don't have somebody else helping us to try and stay in the adult, starting to work through and remember who we are, not getting into these little tug of wars between the, the two other parts that don't know how to love, we will absolutely crash as a person. We'll fall back into guilt. We'll fall back into anger. We'll fall back into fear. We'll fit, run right back into rage. And what are the things we're supposed to be living above? Without fear and without guilt. This is our goal, to live, as Paul talked, courageously, purely, guilt-free, pure, loved, and confident and strong. This is our goal. This is what God gave us to do. Jesus said, I have come that you can have life in misery, in agony, married to the wrong person, in frustration in every single day of your life. Is that what he said? No. no. Please, I have come to give you life more abundantly. Abundantly. Full and overflowing life. But you didn't know I was going to marry that person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Pretty well I had that figured out. <laughs> Remember, I chose 12 of you. 
And you were always a pain in the neck to me. <laughs> Everyone. But I still loved you. And I wanted to take care of you. And I wanted you to be strong. And I didn't condemn you. I didn't let me live with you. I didn't try to storm on you. Remember how I took care of you? I didn't take care of the people in your life the way I took care of you. Love as I have loved you. Okay, he's a No problem. Until we get into our first argument. <laughs> And then it's all me. I want what I need. I want this to be, to meet my needs. And so it, we are in an ongoing, lifelong program to learn about ourselves and everyone else around us and how to take care of each other better. 